welcome to Screams from the Grave. We are your hosts from Rat Side Review, Greg Noggle and Lou Mavs, coming at you live, but better than Tesla. How are you doing, Greg? Very good. How about you? Good. And I said the first live of the show. We're not live. This was pre-recorded, <laughs> but who cares? Greg and I hey, are. If it a- worked for Kiss, it's fine for us. <laughs> Okay, we're going deep 70s live albums. Good enough for me. <laughs> um, so Greg and I are on a mission to bring back Screams from the Grave. You know, we had a couple of episodes earlier this year, including Cuddy Sark and Mama's Boys. This episode, we're actually going to go more of a group who was very, very popular on an international basis in the 1980s. But in the 70s, they were just building I guess, what was to come in the next decade. From Germany, we have the classic Scorpions album, In Trance. And I swear to God, does that woman not look like Debbie Harry on the front cover? (laughs) She does. She looks exactly like Debbie Harry. And another thing I find funny about this is uh, Uli Roth has always, oh, those those were the... uh, those covers for all three of those albums were the record company's idea. And we had nothing to do with them. That is clearly his guitar. That woman is bending over. Oh, absolutely. That's the cream colored uh, <laughs> maple neck strat. And uh, yeah, Uli, I think you're lying. I think you had something to do with it. Don't, don't, you know, don't shame yourself. It is what it is. It was the seventies. Yeah. And then on, on top of her looking like Debbie Harry, she also looks a bit like Monica Daneman who Uli was dating at the time, Jimi Hendrix's last girlfriend. Yes, yes, yes. A very long-lasting relationship that he had with Monica before she passed away. Yeah. Honestly, right down to the top she's wearing on the cover, it looks like something Monica would wear. Because I'm a big Uli Roth fan and Hendrix too, so I've seen a ton of pictures of her. I actually never seen a picture of her, so I'll have to Google that. This is, of course, the Scorpions' third album, their second with Uli John Roth or Ulrich Roth, I guess, however you remember him, but to us, he's Uli John Roth. Two points I'm going to make about this album. Number one, Uli John Roth was my favorite guitarist in the Scorpions. And number two, this is my all-time favorite Scorpions album. Me as well, on both counts. Very Uli nice. Roth's my favorite guitarist, and this is my favorite album of theirs. And also, arguably, the album where Scorpions really become Scorpions right down to the fact that it's the first time that logo was used and production by Peter Dirks. Yeah. Is this the first one he did or did he do uh, fly to the rainbow? He did not do fly to the rainbow that you are correct. This is his first. Okay. And that is by no means a knock on Matthias jobs. Who has been the Scorpions league guitar since the eighties. He's a phenomenal guitarist and definitely not a knock on Michael Schenker, who, you know, he's one of my all-time favorites, but, you know, he, he even though he formed and played on the first Scorpions album, Lonesome Crow and Love Drive, he's more known for his stuff with UFO. Let's face facts. And, mm-hmm. you know, big credit to Rudolf Schenker as a songwriter. But Uli was just, you know, I mean, this guy, I if there's one thing I had to say about Uli, it's that when a lot of guitarists in the 1980s were borrowing heavily from like that european style Mm -hmm. you know there's two guitar players that come to mind richie blackmore who was famous on an international level thanks to deep purple and uli john roth who you could tell was probably more famous on a european level but my god like everything he did people completely took from you know including his usage of a fender strat with three single coils as a point as opposed to playing like a Gibson SG or a flying V or a Les Paul that's got humbuckers, you know, um, his use of the the vibrato, his use of classical music, his usage of Hendrix type, you know, uh, sonic, uh, the sounds that he would do, you know, the exploiting feedback as a tool, as opposed to a hindrance, you know, I mean, and on top of that, just killer songwriting, my God, like, you know, and, and, and I discovered in trance, by accident because it was on the Live Bites album that came out in 95 and it was the one pre-Love Drive song that happened to be on it and I heard it and I'm like, my God, I never heard this song before. So I actually went out and tried to find 
the album, which thankfully I did because RCA did release them on CD. So when I found it, this was the Scorpions album that I repeatedly played more than their popular albums, Love Drive, Animal Magnetism, Blackout, and Love of First Sting. Um, hands down to this day, um, there's a rawness to it. There's um, just, I think, some of their best songwriting. Like, this was Scorpions on the mission to say, we're the band, you know? Like, they yeah. were hungry on this album, in my opinion. And it's so expressive and emotional, too. Like, that uh, that article I sent you where Uli John Roth was talking about uh, tone earlier. God, it's just amazing on this. There's so many highs and lows that you just... You feel it. I mean, you really do. Might might make you feel a little melancholy or it'll lift your soul up or you're ready to rock with it like on Dark Lady, you know? And that, when I first heard Dark Lady, I was like, this is not Scorpions I'm used to. You know? <laughs> like, you know, with the uh, odd... <laughs> with the oddly placed innuendos that they would have in their lyrics in the 80s. And then all of a sudden it comes like this, this screeching guitar. It just blasts you in the face the way Dark Lady did. And I was like, OK, th th that's a song like Detroit Rock City. I think I had that on repeat for about three weeks before I moved on to the rest of the <laughs> album. <laughs> I can understand why it's that good. I mean, me, me personally, I had Tokyo tapes first. Um, a neighbor of mine gave me a bunch of his old cassettes and it was like, you know, Blackout, Love Drive, Animal Magnetism, and the only thing from the 70, well, okay, Love Drive was 79, whatever, but the only thing from the Roth era was uh, Tokyo Tapes, and Top of the Bill just blew me away, that that chunky, almost funky guitar riff he plays, and then Klaus's vocals, and I was like, okay, it says it's from the In Trance album, I have to go find this. Mm. and luckily the sets were kind of on the way out at the time so i was able to get all three albums at once but this was my favorite from the start i mean dark lady just the way it wails out of there and entrance is so great and it just all of side one flows together so well but um it may be the most basic song on the record but robot man is the one that really thrilled me that i used to play on repeat all the time when you're listening to it as a kid, it's fun, you know, like, yes, it, it's like the kid friendly hard rock song, but I still like it. I'm not going to lie. Guilty pleasure. All you want. I don't care. I'm not I, I I don't plead guilty to liking anything that might be embarrassing. I like it. So, yeah, I also have kind of a funny memory attached to it. So I'd listen to these Scorpions records constantly. And there was just a point in time where. Me and my buddy Craig would be sitting around, you know, a couple different days just in the afternoon smoking the bong. And it ended up being called, we started calling it the bong song because we noticed every time we were doing it, Robot Man was playing. Well, that's quite fitting. And I can see how that could be a positive memory. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of funny because the, the way they're singing about the lyrics and then how you can get if you're super high like them, like this actually fits almost too well. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I have to admit the, the album I didn't the song on this album, I didn't expect to capture me the way that it did. But it's probably one of my favorites. Um. I don't know if I'm hard pressed to say that it is my favorites. I mean, I, I love every song on this, but there was just something about the emotion behind the song Evening Wind when I heard it. It just it completely captured me. Like, I mean, I, I was just fixated. And to hear Klaus Mina hit these wailing notes out of nowhere, it's like, you know, Ralph Vieira made a point. He said, when the day Klaus Mina passes away, he will only then be referred to as one of the greatest voices in hard rock. And I think it's a shame because I think he, his greatness should be paid more attention to today because he is a powerhouse. I mean, this is a guy who completely lost his voice. He lost the ability to sing right before blackouts and somehow <laughs> managed to, to find the guts to, to come back and, you know, relearn everything that he had learned and, and you know, and, 
and just improve upon what he was doing. So yeah, I, I, I would hate to think that people only remember Klaus in memoriam. Cherish him now while he's still here. That's all I'm going to say, people. Yeah, I really hope so. And that's one of the things where I find it's a shame, especially in the States where uh, vocalist musicians in general from different countries, but especially vocalists, oh, they've got that, 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 that weird accent to the voice. And it doesn't affect it at all. It just makes it unique to me. But I mean, the highs he hits and the lows and just the way the melody carries you throughout this whole record and all scorpions in general, honestly, um, his voice is one of the most important instruments to the band, even though Ulrich does a good job on dark lady and, uh, oh, sun in my man, hand, but no sun in my hand. Thank you. I wanted to say drifting sun, but that's on fly to the rainbow. Also a good one. But yeah, I mean, you know, you had Francis uh, Buchholz on bass, who unfortunately in the uh, <laughs> in the world of the Scorpions, he is no longer a viable entity, which uh, that's uh, unfortunate. Yeah, we won't touch that with a 20 foot pole. And Rudy Lenners was the drummer on this. And, you know, I mean, I love Herman Rarabell. I think he's a, a great drummer, but, you know, Rudy holds his own on this. I love Herman Rarabell, but uh, Lenners has a a certain groove that him and Francis and Uli are all together in on this record. That is, it's great. And it's unique. Not that Herman did a bad job. I mean, I love Tokyo tapes. It's my favorite live album, but they, yeah, all I can think of is to call it as a groove, but they really connect on this. I really like the way that the rhythm section locked in on songs like longing for fire. You know, uh, yes. I, I know that's a, that that's a very odd bass line to play against the guitar along with the drums because the the the, the drum the guitars are, are are just playing straight chords and the bass is actually leading that song and the way Rudy does not Rudy Lenners does not skip a beat with that and and I I just really appreciate the way that the rhythm section on that song locks in, you know, we didn't even go through all the songs yet. I mean, you know, we, we talked about no. <laughs> dark lady, which is a phenomenal opener. Uh, yeah, there's the title track in trance, which is amazing. I, I don't know. I don't know if you'd really call it a ballad or not. I don't like calling songs it, ballads anymore. I'm tired. Of <laughs> this, is, this is almost like, like borderline prog kind of see that was the other cool thing about squirps they always kind of did their own thing well except for eye to eye but we're not talking we don't that. talk about eye to eye <laughs> yeah. um, i mean it's almost space rocky in a way like it, yeah. it, it it's it's almost it, it's funny like at the time ufo were bigger than the scorpions and, you know, Michael has always accused Rudolph of ripping him off. Um, I won't agree with Michael on that. But if you take a song like Space Child off of Phenomenon, uh, UFO's mm -hmm. uh, first album with Michael, and you take a song like Entrance off this one, you know, you can almost kind of play them back to back and see that there's like a feel there. But I mm -hmm. don't. I don't think Rudolph, regardless of what I may think of him personally, I don't think he actually set out to rip off Michael because even Uli said that Rudolph was a great songwriter before the Scorpions hit it big. So, you know, and, and I'm biased towards Uli, so I'm willing to agree with him. Yeah, me too. And, um, you know, they're brothers, so yes, he probably picked up a little something from him, but um, number one, already an accomplished songwriter, and really, I think Entrance is the album where he really finds that signature Ru Rudolf Schenker sound and his way of playing the guitar, and I think he kind of did it in tandem with playing off of what Uli was doing. I, I really don't hear any Michael in Rudolph's playing ever so you're saying you think rudolph became a better guitarist and songwriter because of his collaboration with uli yes i agree with I, that i i think well in trance to me is just the strongest one out of the three i i, I would rate this album a 10 out of 10 because i'm with oh, you on that screw it, I'll, pick, 
I'll pick on Uli a little bit. There, there, there's a couple missteps on the uh, two follow-ups. <laughs> Hellcat. Um... The album cover of Virgin Killer alone is disturbing. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because it's got some great tunes on it, like Pictured Life. and uh, Catch but Train. Anyway, yeah, Catch Your Train, that's another one. But um, yeah, it's it feels like he he really gelled well with Francis and especially Uli and what they were doing. And then he developed his own sound over the years. But I feel like where it came out of is this collaboration that starts here because you can hear it begin here. And then by the time you get to taken by force, like um, on we'll, we'll burn the sky, his sound is fully formed, but it, you can tell where it came out of him. Him and Michael might have played together in, on In Search of the Peace of Mind and, uh, you know, Lonesome Crow, but there's nothing on that album that really points to what Rudolph was going to sound like later. This does, especially on songs like Robot Man. Yeah, but, uh, you know, we, we've we mentioned, uh, you know, Top of the Bill, Life's Like a River, um, there's, you know, there's Robot Man, uh, Evening Wind, Son of my hands, longing for fire, which, uh, you know, again, it's hard for me to pick a song that's my favorite. I mean, I just know that Evening Wind was a song that just really captured me and left a positive impression. I even love Polar Nights. I think it's one of the uh, best instrumentals well, that they've ever released. Night Lights is on this. Polar Nights is the follow up. Uh, God to that damn it. Switch. I'm an idiot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sorry. That one, <laughs> Nightlight is a is a is a wonderful. I know the album, people. Okay, it's been a long day, and we're doing this on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon. Okay, anyway, <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. This album is a total straight ten out of ten, and probably one, the strongest that the Scorpions uh, first ever sounded on record. And you know, that's not taking anything away from Lonesome Crow because there's some gems on that, or. Uh, Flight of the Rainbow, which is, you know, um, a, a song off that that I love. And you can't get more Star Trek than uh, They Need a Million. I mean, the way yeah. they just break <laughs> off into that middle thing. I'm just like a picturing some green chick dancing around Kirk. I can't help it. It's it's very spacey, but I like it. I wonder if they were enjoying some green stuff. But here's an interesting uh, question that I posed to you, Greg. Um, so, okay. you know, I, I've always considered the Scorpions to be the preeminent German hard rock heavy metal act. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, all due respect to bands like Accept and Creator and Destruction and Halloween. But people were referring to the Scorpions as kraut rock. And I've always thought that was interesting because, you know, mm -hmm. when, when I hear of that, well, well first of all, it's a, it sounds like a pretty demeaning term, but I mean, this is what they were describing craft work as and i yeah. was like i was like how how do you get any similarities between scorpions and Kraftwerk with uh with the exception being that they're just they're both german like i don't get it yeah that has to be because they're german and people are just ignorant looking for a quick definition because i've heard a few uh kraut rock bands and they're, they're all more like craft work like uh new wavy type stuff like that uh yeah that's where I go. the scorps never went that direction so i don't understand that no that's weird i think it's just people trying to get um credibility well with a dumbass statement like that i can tell you you have none anyway <laughs> No, I mean, the, the only thing I can even think of out of their whole canon that has a uh, even a rhythm kind of similar to something like that is maybe the rhythm line to suspend her love. But even that's stretching it a little bit. Possibly. And I realize that the, the question I just asked you is incredibly far fetched. But I just remember that I, I think I read that in, in a magazine article once and I was just like, I, I don't see it. I don't get it. And you could tell me as many times until you're blue in the face that that's the way it is. And I will always um, contradict you and say, no, it's not. <laughs> and that's my dog fine. agrees too. He's barking. <laughs> I'm the same way when it comes to people calling Aerosmith heavy metal. I, I'm sorry. I don't care what Kerrang said in 1976. They're good, but they're blues rock. Sorry. 
<laughs> I, I agree with that statement, and I love classic Aerosmith, but it is not metal. It you know, uh, but you know, I I think that at the time, anything that was loud and distorted got that terminology, which is which is funny because like you know, if you think about the kinds of amps that they were using back in the day, you know, for the most part, they were like Marshall Plexi one hundreds which only had one channel. So it wasn't that they were heavily distorted. It's just the volume was cranked all the way up. Yep. So, you know, um, I think people should just really like learn their history and, 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 and just better understand the nuances. And, and, you know, and we're not trying to sound like elitist snobs when we say that, but it's just, there's, there's certain sounds associated with rock, hard rock, you know, heavy metal, and, you know, and we don't care about like sub genres or things like that, because, you know, in the end, good music is good music. But, you know, to label something like Aerosmith as heavy metal, it's disingenuous, like labeling yes. Scorpions kraut rock. Anyway, exactly. You're wrong. wrong! Thank you, John McLaughlin. <laughs> um, but you did send me an article earlier about uh, something Uli said. And uh, as a guitar player, I found it very interesting. And, and I'll actually quote it. It's on ultimateguitar.com. Uh, it was a recent um, interview with Uli John Roth. He was basically asked during his visit to the uh, Academy of Tone podcast, so a credit to them, Uli reflected on what the interview called his screaming guitar tone, admitting that he learned from the best since he witnessed Jimi Hendrix playing live. I envy Uli for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Uli compared the guitar tone of the older generation with younger artists. Apart from Jimmy, he reflected on Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton, and Mick Taylor, who if no one knows who that is, he was the lead guitarist of the Rolling Stones before Ron Wood, calling them sound conscious. However, he then added, this is an art form that sadly has been almost completely lost. Nowadays, there are a lot of kids who have fantastic technique, and you could see a lot of them on YouTube shorts. And they're very musical, they could play, et cetera. But it's so rare that you hear someone who cares about tone and expression as they all tend to sound factory made. And I can't blame them because that's how they grew up. So as a guitar player, I'm not gonna call myself a musician because I don't make my living playing music. But as a guitar player, I could agree with that statement. From when I first realized that I could play, my whole purpose was to find my own voice within my instrument, you know, to ch channel the right sound with the right guitar, the right strings, the right pickup and the right amp and be able to express how I feel or what I'm thinking through my playing. So it's like if I write a guitar solo where it's like I want the listener to hear joy or anger or whatever, I will express that however best I can through the tools that I have. And that, and that is from uh, an emotional standpoint. From a mechanical standpoint, it's very hard to completely lug around all of your equipment from your home to the venue and back, <laughs> knowing that at my age of 43 years old, I'm more prone to back issues now than I was when I was in my early 20s. That being said, I don't think it's necessary to have the full the full stack of, you know, the head and two cabinets to lug around with me anywhere. You know, now it's like, you know, if, if the room is big enough, you know, you bring your amp, you mic it up to the PA and boom, there you go. If the room is too small then you can bring this and this is not an advertisement for horizon devices but um i'm very happy with this preamp that i could put on my pedal board and go direct from here to the pa play i think my dog is really tired of hearing about my horizon devices preamp anyway <laughs> so you know horizon, then Lou free stuff <laughs> so you know uh plug it directly into the pa and you know, get the clean tone that you want through the, you know, through no channel and get the right amount of distortion or overdrive that you want from here. But in at the end of the day, the difference, what I think separates me is, again, I'm not using guitar playing as a way to sound like everybody else. I'm doing me. So right. 
I agree with Uli that I feel like sometimes you have a lot of guitar players that do show up on YouTube and you're all great. But with the exception of a few of you, I can't tell the difference. I'm sorry. I agree with Uli Roth. I have to as well. I mean, it, and it's very, very important, which is why just there's a lot of more modern bands and newer stuff where I just can't call it a favorite because it doesn't really resonate with me emotionally because it's very clean. It's very well played. They're great players, but there's no, there's no warmth to the tone really there it's not expressive enough like on on evening wind you you can feel that in your heart when it uh his guitar ascends with uh klaus's voice and even during the leading lead up to it and throughout the whole album you know it just it's expressive it's almost lyrical with the tones a lot of these guys had in the 70s buck dharma from blue oyster cults another real good one for, for comparison yeah and you know i yeah. i get a little tiffed when i hear uh people knock certain guitar players for relying on the pentatonic scale there is a, a youtuber that i enjoy called bradley hall i find him to be entertaining uh but he was the one that publicized his distaste for kirk hammett as a guitarist for not utilizing his playing skill to its full capability and relying on the pentatonic scale. Now, regardless of how you personally feel about Kirk Hammett, you may love him, you may hate him, you may respect him, you you may care less. But, you know, Kirk's been doing it for 40 years. I may not prefer his playing style, but I respect him for doing what he's doing. So I, I think it's... um I think it's very diminishing to not guitar players that don't play the same as you. At the same token, mm -hmm. to knock guitarists who rely on the pentatonic scale, I think it's a cheap shot because it's not if you play the pentatonic scale, it's how well you do what you do with the pentatonic scale. And Bug Dharma, you listen to those Blue Oyster Cult albums and you tell me that his playing doesn't make the hair on your arms rise. Yep. Every, everybody should listen to the live version of Veteran of the Psychic Wars. On Thank the you. Electra, extraterrestrial live album from 82. That is one of the best solos of all time. I agree with your statements. Uh, that being said, uh, bringing it back to the Scorpions, I feel like with Uli, they were truly coming into their own. Obviously, losing Uli didn't hurt them. I mean, it hurt us who will, won't hear Uli with the Scorpions anymore unless we listen to Entrance, Virgin Killer, and Taken by Force in Tokyo Tapes. Um, but I'm sure the Scorpions are not crying their way to the bank, and Uli doesn't seem to be hurting either because he's got a killer band that he goes out with. And, you know, I would him and Steve Hackett are two guitar players I would love to see in concert one day. And I hope that time comes and... You know, Uli, if you are watching this episode, please consider this an open invitation to come on Rat Style Review because Greg and I love you, man. <laughs> please do. That would be amazing. I would love to talk to Uli and Electric Sun. And I, I just love his playing in general. I, I stuck with him even after Scorpions. <laughs> and Very I know cool. you did too. Yeah. I did too. So we're going to wrap this up. Greg and I both agree. Entrance from the Scorpions. Uh, one of the many albums that time seems to have forgotten because it doesn't have Rocky Like a Hurricane on it. But in Greg, in my opinion, it's the best Scorpions album out there. So go and enjoy it. Yep, definitely. Especially if you're a Scorpions fan, but you haven't delved back yet. This is the perfect one to do it with. Excellent. Anything you want to plug, my friend? Just keep watching Screams from the Grave and Rats Out Review. I don't have anything else coming up. That's right. And don't forget, ratsidereview.com. You can link to all of our social media. Also, don't forget, severedangel.com. You can buy your copy of the album, which is out now. And just to let you know, by the time this episode gets released, there's an all-week Black Friday sale over on our merch, 40% off. Buy our stuff. Do you understand? And that's about it. <laughs> <laughs>
Please, we need to eat. Tenemos dinero, por favor. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thanks for watching Screens from the Grave. For Greg Noggle, this is Lou Mabs. Demone. <laughs>